Hello and welcome to Media and Brain 1 and 2 in the summer term 2021. My name is Horst Eidenberger. Um, this year, since we still have the corona pandemic, uh, the majority of the videos was taken from, from last year because they are still accurate and, and um, can still be used. Please don't mind wrong dates there. Um, Content-wise, it is actually the same course or very similar course to last year's. There is just an add-on of knowledge that I found interesting over the year and that I would like to share with you. And I would also like you to include in your uh, summaries and consider for your seminar papers and for your presentations. The main topic of, uh, of this add-on is learning in a biologically plausible way. That means implementing neural algorithms for learning that actually can be trained and can uh, evolve in the, in the human brain as well as they can in artificial neural networks. Some algorithms are in, in the discussion, for example, backpropagation, which is very successful in the artificial, in the computational domain, but it is not straightforward to see how backpropagation should be implemented in um, human, human brain, in the human brain. Um, there is a paper on that one too in this presentation. Okay, it's just a, to actually watch the video. Okay, what is about to come? I would like to add some terms and concepts that we didn't have in the other videos. Those are taken mostly from a paper that appeared in 2019. It's a very nice summary. There is a references table at the end of the presentation. Um, they are also linked in the Tubal forum in the, um, in, the, on, in the page where the topics are listed. You also find the complete list of references that I'm using here and now. Um, plus the links to the papers. They are all available if you access them from your TU account. So we have a license for that. Okay, after the terms, I would like to introduce you with the notion of predictive coding um, based on a book that recently appeared and was written by Professor Clark from Edinburgh University. Um, predictive coding will be explained on, the, on a later slide. The fundamental idea is that you don't just perceive and categorize, but you try in the brain to predict what will come next, which would come in very handy when you have to compare, when you, because it provides you a mean to compare reality to what um, you think should happen and that error between the two can be used to train the network. Okay, furthermore, I would like to go through three papers that I read recently on biologically plausible learning. The first one deals with the implementation of um, um, Bayesian inference in the brain or in neural networks, that is important because Bayesian inference is heavily used in neurosciences and cognitive sciences in order to identify phenomena and to describe them. It would, of course, then be very nice if they could be directly translated into neural structures, these insights. The second paper is on backpropagation in the brain. I already mentioned that backpropagation algorithm is very successful in computational networks. Unfortunately, it's not pretty straightforward to see how it would be implemented in the brain. Feedback connections do exist, but they are on a different level, apparently, than what backpropagation needs or actually provides. The last paper is very recent. It is another example or a very advanced example of how neural structure for learning so-called pl functional plasticity could be implemented here for the sense of smell in the mammalian brain. Um, after that, we'll draw some conclusions and I'll also provide some of my own ideas um, that you can use as starting points for your seminar works, <clears throat> in particular on how Bayesian inference can, could actually be modeled in sophisticated ways um, on neural structures. Okay, let's start with the terms and the concepts. Um, terms are here on the left hand side. One term that I would like to be aware of, would like you to be aware of, is the so-called default network. 
when the neuroscientists speak of the default network, they mean those brain regions that are active when you're not, you the subject, are not performing a specific task. So this includes, for example, the autonomous system that regulates your physiology. Um, another term um, that is very, very important and I already mentioned is that in neuroscience these days results are very often described in a Bayesian probabilistic way and therefore probabilistic inference is used um, in order to draw conclusions from prior. So the knowledge that you have before or what is already implemented in the structure under observation is uh, based, is um, is processed with additional input in order to create posterior information. Okay, the next term that I would like uh, you to, to know or to remind is, I mentioned it already, is plasticity. Plasticity is what happens when something that you actually um, perceive in the brain and cognitively process is transformed into structure. So on the most fundamental layer, um, the creation of synaptic connections between two neurons and the enhancement of those. As you know, one or two connections between two neurons are not sufficient in order to um, propagate uh, information. You need 50, 100, 200 of such connections. And that is called functional plasticity because it provides the actual learning function on the micro level of the neural group. There is also the structural Plasticity and by structural plasticity, we mean actually the adaptation of the centers of the brain. So what happens in which part of the brain and why does it happen there? A lot of that is prior encoded, evolutionary developed. The cerebellum has a particular function in the motor, uh, in the motoric um, abilities of the human being and these are partially hardwired also the connection weights are hardwired and the whole structure is given other structures however appear to be developed um, during life through learning if you think for example of bilingualism or multilingualism they create significantly different structures from what you have if you have just one mother language um, that is something that is certainly falls into the category of structural plasticity. Both are, of course, relevant for learning. The current state of affairs in neurosciences and cognitive sciences is that structural learning is, as far as I've found, mostly out of scope and it's mostly about the functional side of the learning. Okay. When it comes to functional neuroplasticity, there are two fundamental processes. One is the long-term potentiation, that means the enhancement, the increase between two connections, so a successful co-firing pattern that encodes a certain co-occurrence of fundamental priors, thus describing some uh, some concept that is relevant. Uh, ball and cheer is football game, for example. And on the other hand, long-term depression means that synaptic connections are fading out, are getting lost, and therefore a connection is forgotten and, and some pattern is unlearned, actually. Okay, so much for the terms. When it comes to this neural implementation of credit assignment, so the plasticity, there are three fundamental ways. And another term that you should use uh, or that you can use and, and will sometimes appear in the literature that you read is the term of credit assignment. That is just another word for the learning process. So how important do you judge the co-occurrence of certain stimuli in order to uh, classify them in a particular way. So there are three fundamental approaches that I would like you to be aware of. The one is the usage of so-called population codes, probabilistic population codes. That is the common notion of having a group of neurons that are firing, recording their firing patterns, their spikes, and deriving information from that and, of course, um, transforming that, that into probability distributions, which can be nicely done with the methods of, of, of signal processing and of applied statistics. Um, and thus, with the probability descriptions, distributions, be able to describe certain behaviors. So that is what happens a lot in neuroscience, and that is also 
um, a very visually a very nice way to describe what is what is going on in a certain environment and in a certain situation. So if you hear the term population codes, you know that is this pattern that there are these uh, spiking patterns that describe and encode certain situations. The opposite is the or kind of the opposite is the sampling approach. But the fundamental idea is that each neuron or each neural group, each unit, so to speak, encodes one stimulus, one variable, one input, whatever that means. Please be aware that this is not mutually exclusive with, with population codes. Actually, population codes might implement a, a sampling strategy. So it's actually a bigger concept than, than the sampling concept because simply the spike trains can be so fundamentally different and disjoint that it is actually a sampling curve that is presented in the population code. And eventually, I would like you to, to make you familiar with this idea of predictive coding. Um, as I said before, here the fundamental approach is that the brain doesn't stop at classifying the inputs, but goes further and predicts what will happen next, compares the prediction with reality, um, from that derives an error signal and uses the error signal for, for example, cancelling out what, uh, is, uh, what the brain is already aware, so attenuation, um, but also for learning, for giving feedback for, for example, long-term um, depression of unwanted connections and so on. It's very charming and we'll come back on the next, on the next slide when we speak about it the predictive processing model. Okay, another term that I don't want you to forget, we have it every year and it is somewhere in the other, in the other videos as well, is the so-called heart problem, which is uh, the simple fact that the brain is actually locked in your head. No? The only input the brain gets is electric. The only output it generates is also electric. It depends on sensor cells and it depends on motor cells um, motor neurons, nerve fibers, uh, muscle fibers, in order to communicate with the world. So the hard problem is how under these circumstances our brains were able to develop an hopefully accurate view of the world, including colors, behavior patterns, interaction between human beings and mastering te technologies such as being able to, to uh, flying somebody to the moon which is, considering that the brain is isolated, a real miracle, actually. That is summarized as the heart problem. And it, of course, it's just a, a, a different, different view that you can have at the fundamental learning problem. Learning as understanding what is happening in the brain and in the second iteration, transferring that into code, into plasticity at the minimum level. Okay, another thing that is that is coming back, it has, I observed it already over the last few years, are the spiking neural networks, which implement, for example, the population codes. The idea of the spiking nets is simply that the spike train matters, so spike means that the neuron actually fires based on the membrane potential that is, again, um, excited or inhibited by prior neurons that have synaptic connections to the neuron. Please watch the other videos or, or in particular also read the first seven chapters of Kandel et al. Um, so that you have a fundamental understanding of neural networks. And these spike trains encode the information. That's the idea of a spiking neural networks. Why are they re-emerging? It was uh, actually a topic of hot research before deep learning and deep neural networks acted as a game changer in classification, computer vision and related domains. Um, then, at least for me, they got a little bit out of focus. Uh, for some time I didn't hear about spiking neural networks anymore, but they are now re-emerging because of their power to interpret what, uh, what cognitive and neurosciences have recently found out. That there is a lot going on in this domain. A lot of information is, is generated, is identified. A lot of new insights are found and from different areas, people come together and, and, and try to decode how the brain on the fundamental layer of the neural group actually works. And spiking net neural networks are then very handy when it is about simulating what is actually going on. So there are two fundamental approaches. Of course, it's always about summarizing spikes that appear in, in a temporal neighborhood, 
thus creating another firing pattern and subsequent processing in a, in a network or in a tree whatsoever, um, the so-called um, perceptive field of the neuron. Um, yeah, and there are two fundamental ways. The one is just to take just the spikes, encode just the spikes and sum them up. This is then called spike timing plasticity. And the other one is also to use the information, the gaps between two spikes to encode information. So this is like amplitude sampling and, and uh, frequency sampling, if you want, in encoding theory. Um, and to employ also these temporal gaps between the spikes in order to provide some form of rate encoding. The, as far as I could see, the first approach is currently the more uh, prominent one, maybe because it is able to actually encode everything and it is much simpler than the second one. The big problem of spiking neural networks today are, as far as I was informed by, by, by one of the former students of this course, Mr. Niederlechner, is that the libraries that exist currently are not performant. So they don't reach an, a, a fraction of the a significant fraction of the performance that we are today used from deep neural networks, if you think of the TensorFlow library, for example. And that, of course, means that they cannot uh, master really complex, for example, vision tasks in an acceptable amount of time. But given their ability to be biologically plausible and to test hypotheses for the plausibility, they certainly have a have future and uh, I recommend you to have a look into that. Okay, last thing that I want you to remind you of, um, it's also somewhere else in the slides, learning. Whenever it happens in human beings, usually happens in four steps. In the first, you are unconscious and incompetent. Certainly, you become, given through some, some inputs and stimulation, you become aware of your incompetence, so you're consciously incompetent. Hopefully, then, you will try to remove the incompetence, consciously learning, becoming competent. And then happens something that is often forgotten in the last step of the learning process, you become unconscious again. So you forget about this effort that you had when you learned what you what you wanted to understand and become eventually unconsciously competent. That's when the people say, why am I, am I an expert? I, I don't know a thing. It doesn't mean that they're incompetent again. It means that they're still competent, but they have forgotten about the ways to so become unconsciously competent. Don't forget this letter. So this is, a, is this is a colorful mix of, of things that I would like you to have you in your toolbox so that you can understand the papers that I'm going through now a little bit better, but also um, follow the, uh, the current debate on, on what's going on. Okay. Let's go on with uh, predictive processing. I told you before, the fundamental idea is that you predict what will come next and use that information in a so-called forward model um, to um, create feedback for the learning process. Um, the fundamental thing here is the prediction error. With the prediction error, you can, on the one hand, um, give a uh, rate the credibility of your classification results. And on the other hand, you can employ that for learning. Um, Clark, from which uh, I took this, this concept, um, the link is again in the references, uh, speaks that we are, or says that we are in constant expectation because we are always not just perceiving what's going on passively, but actively uh, guessing what will come next which is a completely different thing in terms of agitation, in terms of awareness. Okay, uh, furthermore, um, yeah, the feedback can be used to train the neural network on the neural representatives of the uh, probabilistic models. That is an important aspect. So for him, it is clearly um, that the brain is, is a Bayesian network, that it is a probabilistic model in which the, the whole goal is to predict the error and to minimize the error, so to learn and get experience in order to be able to be to deal with the environment without surprises. But there are a lot of other hypotheses in the in the reference as well, and I would highly recommend you to read this book. It's not just for the course, 
but if you have a general interest in the, in the domain, it's a really nice summary of many theories in the area of neuroscience that are interesting and relevant. Um, one thing, one notion that he describes and that I fully share and that we also have in the other videos a couple of times mentioned in our model of artificial consciousness is he speaks of the rolling sensimotor cycles. So he finds that the brain is not a simple input processing output model that takes uh, sensory stimuli, uses interneurons to do some complex processing and then creates output via the motor um, neurons but that we are constantly actually contemplating what it means, constantly learning, that learning uh, pushes or transfers into plasticity and, um, and, and, and changes the whole structure of the brain. Um, that is something I, I, can, I, can, I can fully support and I also like the term rolling sensor motor cycles. Um, and he also speaks of, put the, of, of the so-called perception action loop. So we are constantly perceiving and we are constantly acting. We are trying to optimize by minimizing our loss, our error from the goal function or cost function as they also say in neuroscience. Um, and that is an endless process. Okay. Then an interesting notion I also found, he didn't give uh, any reference to computational models here, but uh, Clark argued the case that uh, the goal, goal of the brain is not just minimization of prediction error, as I just said, but also model simplification. He speaks of the lazy brain, it's the term that he uses. This is, of course, equivalent to the structural risk minimization principle of Vladivir Vapnik in the support vector machine and in machine learning theory, which is kind of interesting. One aspect of model simplification is certainly in the, in the human brain is certainly puberty, where a young adolescents um, lose up to one quarter, I've heard, of their neural connections. So this is a dramatic reorganization of the human brain. And if both of these patterns are, are relevant, then it is really a very intriguing analogy, analogy between the artificial world and the natural world of neural networks. Okay, Clark is also very much in favor of the, of the role of sleep in the learning process, by in particular removing sensory input that is not wanted or that is actually unstable. So this is a case of long-term um, depression of neural connections. He is furthermore uh, <clears throat> uh, also deals with, with the problem of, of attenuation. That means that if you present the same stimulus over and over again, the reaction will get smaller and smaller, which is uh, supported by many findings in psychophysics in particular. There's also a video on that in the, in the course. Um, and, and his idea is that necessarily what appears again and again is better and better predicted and if the prediction error becomes smaller these elements are then uh, cancelled out and that is a very nice description actually of what, what is going on. It might go as far as that there is no sensation at all anymore. Famous example for that is uh, is the question of tickling. It is very hard for oneself to tickle uh, and, and receive pleasure from tickling yourself, for example, in the arm, whereas it is normally easy for someone else doing that. And one explanation could be that the effect of the tickling is actually uh, expected by the brain, by the predictive processing of the brain, and therefore cancelled out, because it's well predicted. Which is a very um, good, very nice, very understandable explanation. Okay, then another thing that he observes and, and describes in the book is that cent the whole centers are reconfigured sometimes based on some uh, norm that is presented before, like artificial context. Sometimes a particular word is sufficient to do a reconfiguration and it appears to be that certain neural centers, depending on the configuration, depending on the priming, do a different form of processing so that they are multi-use um, centers in different contexts. That, of course, would, if that is true, 
it would mean that uh, the complexity of the brain is, is uh, by uh, whole degrees bigger than what we expected and would make it even harder to decode the actual functional meaning of certain functions. Furthermore, he gives a very nice explanation for the existence of mirror neurons or mirror centers. To remind you, mirror neurons fire if um, you perceive a particular behavior in somebody else and the same cell would also fire if you would execute the behavior that you're just observing. So bo in both cases, if you do it or if you just observe it, the same neuron fires. Such a neuron is called a mirror neuron or a more adequately a mirror center because it's usually whole packages of neurons that are firing. Um, he argues that this could be a result of predictive coding because it doesn't make much difference if you predict what happens next for yourself or for somebody else. You use the same sensor uh, organs and you use the same computation networks, therefore why should the effect be different? Very nice. Okay, um, another term that I would like you to, to know is the so-called affordance competition. And that means that uh, neural groups are uh, in, in a constant competition over finding out of, or delivering the best hypothesis for what the brain is currently perceiving. That is very similar to my pattern in artificial consciousness of I found of of uh, providing ideas and developing new ideas all the time, developing new hypotheses and the filtering them out with a proper filter layer that somehow guarantees the sanity of the human brain. There are many other theories and many others other models are referenced in the book. I highly recommend you to go through that one. One last term that I would like you to know is the so-called darkened room problem. It's it's call the problem of predictive coding, even though I personally don't see the problem really. Um, the model, of course, cannot explain curiousness and pleasure. If we minimize the prediction error, curiousness is the opposite of what we want. Um, pleasure is also not really in the, in the domain of optimization. Um, yes, that is true, but both of these, um, both of these needs are can be seen in a bigger framework, in my opinion, and, and Clark very persuasively also argues against um, against the statement that these two problems would actually falsify predictive processing. So in summary, I think it's a very interesting model. There is a new task on that in Media and Brain 1, so if you're interested in doing that, um, yeah, register, follow the individual steps. Okay. Another paper that I would like you to have a look at or that I would like to summarize for you is, uh, is a summary on, on what we already know about the Bayesian inference in the neural networks uh, of the brain. It is a very recent paper of 2019. It's very readable. Um, the scope is exclusively on neural plasticity on the functional level. So it's for small neural groups and everything is based on Bayesian inference. It hardly goes beyond that. There, is a few, uh, there are a few comments on structural plasticity, but the real focus is on, on functional one. Okay, as I said many times now, the motivation is that the Bayesian inference is a useful tool in neuroscience. The findings can be very nicely described if you go from population codes to probability distributions and the theory above that. It's um, and there's a nice mechanism and a very useful mechanism and a powerful also for describing um, findings and doing research actually in that area. Two terms, we still have uh, the priors, I mentioned them a couple of times. So this is knowledge that you already have about the concepts and usually described as a fundamental probability distribution for some occurrence, some phenomenon, some stimulus and the probability. Another term that is heavily used in papers like these is the term marginalization. And that is the idea of recovering a prior from joint observations of joint stimuli by simply iterating or summing up 
over all the variables we are not interested in. Please note that y here is of course can be a vector, so it might be hundreds of different dimensions, even though I'm not aware of a practical case for that. Um, but you simply sum up in order to arrive at the probability distribution. If you read marginalization, this is what it's meant. Okay, it was very interesting for me to see that in this paper they heavily use um, um, methodology from from the computational domain latent variables so that means you take the input variables and do a factor analysis on them analysis on them so that they have no covariance anymore log variables in order to convert what is a multiplication in the model into summing up uh, on the technical level of the neurons neurons are very good at summing up input stimuli spike trains but it's rather hard for them to do multiplications. So it's always handy to work with log variables. And as long as you're only looking for the rank in order to, to, to distinguish two possible explanations of concepts, for example, then it's fair enough to work with the logs. Okay, adding Gaussian noise is obvious. Uh, Kalman filtering, I was interested, uh, I was very curious, uh, interested to see that, that this concept is heavily also exploited in um, in the neuroscience domain and using base function that is using some for example radial function in order to define the perceptive field of a neuron okay so they provide in their paper different patterns for the for the simple patterns they implement spiking neurons and normal excitatory patterns for the more complex one um, there are many networks in parallel, and there is also a description of what an algorithm could look like for competition. I must say that the actual central area is a bit, a bit unsatisfactory in the paper, but the preliminaries are very readable and very interesting. There is a small comment on structural learning also, um, where they say that there is so much unused tissue essentially in certain parts of the brain, like in parts of the cerebellum, up to 85%, that when a new concept needs to be learned, the long time potentiation can happen in those unused fibers. So there is basically the grid is there, the matter is there, and it only has to fill, be filled with, with semantic content by um, connecting synapses of and dendrites of different neurons. Yeah, the, the focus of the paper is on simple structures. There's no doubt about that. So in the area of functional plasticity, which is the hot topic anyway of the area currently, um, then what I found unrealistic is that uh, like in predictive coding, they're struggling for optimality, which is, I don't think, is the, is the goal of, of of, of the human brain. Most of the time it's just looking for a way to cope with the situation that is fair enough. So I'd rather see a best effort principle at work than really going for optimality. We are completely satisfied with, with an acceptable local optimum. We call that healthy. No? So why not? Um, yeah. And then there is, of course, the open question, and the, the authors acknowledge that fully, fully, that there is no cost function. So they don't know actually how the feedback is actually created for the learning process. So the big issue here in this paper is to ask the question, okay, we have a probability distribution, we know a certain observed, observed behavior, but how could it have been implemented? in the network. For that they provide very simple solutions, unfortunately nothing sophisticated yet. I was wrong by the way this paper is from 2013. Okay, very nice paper that came out last year is back propagation in the brain. Um, it's also linked in the, in the forum. The context um, is that it is obviously the case that we learn by modifying the neural connections that we have in the brain and that prior knowledge actually does exist. We have a certain structure. The structure of our brains are very similar. So this is obviously a result of evolution. Certain connections are pre-wired and have certain strength in the motoric area, for example. But it's also true that most abilities that we have need to be learned. Nobody is a chess player by nature, for example. Nobody is a musician by nature. 
and so on. You have to learn it. And that means that you have to provide the stimuli, you have to process them in the brain, and, and with the processing over time, plasticity happens. It actually becomes subconscious, unconscious, but the ability is there. So it must be somehow like that. Now the question is, how could that happen in a biological plausible way with backpropagation? The authors come from the group of Professor Hinton from Toronto, and therefore, of course, backpropagation is a huge topic for them. It is very successful in deep neural networks, so it would be nice to see that uh, success also transferred to the natural domain. Two concepts I would like to mention is, the first one is the so-called feedback alignment. That is the idea that normally, or very often, you actually don't need a detailed vector feedback in order to learn something. It might actually be sufficient to have a few control parameters, as few as one, for example, plus a random vector that spans over the input domain in order to, over time and time, actually still learn the correct patterns. Um, in my earlier years, in like 15 years ago, I also wrote a, a couple of papers and did a number of experiments in the machine learning domain where I found out that the vectors actually might even be random um, as long as the control parameters of the learning are not random. And this kind of surprising fact is called feedback alignment. Okay. It is very important. Why? Because in backpropagation, it would be highly unlikely to do as in natural, uh, as in artificial networks, and provide a whole error vector and propagate that through the network. Those structures simply do not exist in the human brain. So it must work different. There are feedback channels, but these have a rather small bandwidth compared to the forward pass, and therefore this notion of control parameters is per se interesting. Okay, another term you should be available, uh, should be familiar with are uh, the so-called neural gradients, NGRAD methods, and that means that you learn by computing differences, error signals between activity states. Activity states, uh, for example, a forward and a backward pass that happen at the same time, thus creating an error signal. Okay, so they suggest in their paper a number of approaches that could be used. Uh, the one that I found most interesting is to stack autoencoders. If you're not aware what is an autoencoder, in the simplest forms, it's a three layer network input processing output, where the processing layer is much smaller than the input and output layer, thus enforcing the input signal to be reduced to a few factors. So it's a factor, a principal component analysis. And from that, you blow up the input signal or the output signal again. That means that you can do simple feed forward learning unsupervised by comparing the output layer to the input layer. And as soon as the error is below a certain epsilon, what does it mean? It means that the mapping to the hidden layer and from the hidden layer to the output layer is sufficiently good to provide real factors. So numbers or variables that are uh, that have no covariance, that are independent of each other. Okay, now you can of course stack such autoencoders um, and, and use them for forward reasoning, and that is their idea. Plus, do a, uh, do a feedback line also with the output of the last layer, go back into the input again, and there make use of feedback alignment. That means propagate only uh, control parameters, and these are then used in the NGRAD way to control the forward pass, where the actual stimuli are processed. The authors of the paper just describe um, the methodology or the approach in general. They don't they don't provide experiments yet, but of course the approach is very charming and, and it could be imagined that in this way, in a spiking neural network, you can actually very nicely learn the parameters net, uh, necessary for having a biologically plausible um, spike train production through a membrane. Okay, yeah.
essential, of course, is the small dimensionality of the feedback channel. Without that, it would not be possible. It might go down even to a simple Scala, Scala value. Okay, they also speculate about how this could actually be implemented in the brain, um, for example, by temporal segregation. That means that neuron at time A has uh, does the forward pass, and the same neuron at time B is utilized for the backward pass, which appears rather complex in terms of synchronization. Or it might be that certain neurons actually per se allow this, this reuse. If you have already watched the other videos, this is essentially a, a very a simple solution would be the gate pattern that I introduced in the pattern. <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Um, that I that I introduced in, 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 in the pattern section of the neurons. This gate pattern provides exactly that. Through a control parameter to as few neurons, you control the whole forward pass. Okay, so that would work in the Good. One last paper, very quickly through that, is also very recently from November 2020. It is um, related to the other paper where it was about how Bayesian learning on, and um, probabilistic reasoning could actually be implemented in neural networks. In this case, it's about the sense of smell in mammals. Um, what the authors provide is an algorithm for the learning of the unknown weights of new smells. So smell is, a, is always a combination of fundamental smells and the weights um, define what, what ingredients you actually have of the fundamentals. And the question is how do you learn that? What they provide is straightforward expectation maximization. So you start with random weights and then do uh, iterating uh, pattern of using the current inputs to compute the outputs and then with the outputs predict the inputs again. They use a heavy and learning rule which is tailor-made for the task. Heavy and learning is something that you have for example in the Boltzmann machine in the Hopfield web, uh, network and it can deal with, with input data, find the local maximum without uh, needing feedback loops. So it's on the one hand, it's very charming. The paper is also very informative about the state of the art right now. Um, and it is mostly biologically plausible. The main problem is um, that uh, they have to deal with multiplications of factors. So they are simply uh, used in a log fashion and then summed up, which is biologically plausible. The disadvantage of the paper is that, of course, heavy and learning is limited in its ability to describe all the complex semantic phenomena that human beings encounter in their life. There must be more sophisticated structures. But maybe on a deeper level of understanding, such patterns, for example, for simple olfactory stimuli, might be sufficient, actually. And in the higher levels, it could be imagined that something like the pattern we saw before with the using autoencoders and the using NGRAD feedback um, might, might actually control the learning process. Okay, some conclusions from my side. Um, certainly the hot topic now is to search for the learning algorithms that are used in the brain. They have to be biologically plausible. On the way we have um, <clears throat> We have two, two ingredients from the computational domain. One are Bayesian networks, uh, probabilistic inference, and the others are the spiking networks that are coming back um, stronger than ever. And with that, you, we want to find out, or neuroscientists want to find out how learning actually happens. That is, of course, of fundamental importance for any form of artificial consciousness. And how, once the learning has happened, this is pushed into plasticity. It is nice if you have it in the role sensor, sensing motor cycles, so in the, in the current state of the brain, but you also want to have it available later unconsciously. And that means you have to create plasticity on the simplest layer by connecting neurons over synapses on the more complex layer by using certain structures for certain, for certain use cases and by also kind of passing it on to posteriority however that is done. Okay, so from the perspective of Clark, there are three levels of research. 
There is the phenomenological description of the pattern that is done probabilistic way. Then there is the neuroscientific um, by imaging uh, methods, for example, investigation of what's going on. And third is purely artificial by computational means, describing uh, the outputs. And these circle around the neural truth and try to fence it off and make it eventually find out what is the case how did we actually master the hard problem of being locked in our bodies? <clears throat> okay, as I said, it's currently mostly fo uh, focused on functional plasticity, hardly anything structural or beyond. Um, there is a big struggle going on for how feedback is actually propagated in the learning process. It is clear that the feedback channels are narrowband in, in comparison to the forward pass of stimulus processing. It is clear that they do exist. It is not yet clear how they influence the whole, the whole process. Personally, I think that with our gate pattern, um, we are actually quite able to describe certain uh, phenomena. Okay. I also got the impression there is a bit of an overestimation of the fact that base networks can actually describe anything. Um, it, I read the statement three or four times in the papers that I mentioned alone that uh, it must be probabilistic inference because it can explain most of the facts that were found and phenomena that were found in research. Well, as you know, probabilistic inference can generally uh, describe anything. But as Einstein already uh, already said and, and speculated, probabilistic inference can never be the last answer because it's just description, yet not explanation of what is going on. So maybe this is overemphasized in the area of neuroscience, but then of course progress is so quick that we can just passively follow what, what these people are actually finding out. Okay. Then I asked myself, as was the last thing, is whether the influence of the computational models is actually good or bad. Um, it is good, of course, because it allows to simulate um, certain ideas and to push the frontier further where we cannot see currently because we don't have the means to, to investigate in the brain. But, of course, it's also bad because the ideas that we have in the artificial networks that are successful there are tried to be transferred to the, to the human, to the natural domain, and some of those might simply not work in natural context. We have it in other areas too. We are able to, to walk and to run, yet we will never be able to drive as human beings with the speed or in the form of a car. Huh? So, the fact that something exists and is successful doesn't mean that it must also be transferable to the other domain of the brain. We would actually do something to get uh, from multi uh, multiplication to adding up, and that would mean to be uh, the work logarithmically, and it would mean, of course, to do heavily parallel processing. That is, of course, a bit hazy. I don't know the details yet. Um, one could think in that direction, of course. Okay, once you have all the inputs and all the building blocks, you have to do to deal somehow with the competition between the neurons. So somehow you have to implement the maximum likelihood principle or best effort. Um, and that would be, again, by some gate pattern where the winner takes it all. Uh, which with maybe the, the, the most prominent spike train that then inhibits all the others and, and cancels them out. So some kind of filter pattern as we saw in artificial consciousness. Learning on the bigger level, I personally think that predictive coding is, is very intriguing. It, it, it provides a bridge from classification to feedback that is kind of natural and for many phenomena really exists in the brain. Uh, very often we actually calculate what will come next, not just in sports, but also in, in many other domains. And the last one is to go from learning to plasticity. I personally think that this notion of the rolling sensory cycles is very intriguing. It could actually uh, have a large effect on plasticity. Plus there is of course the role of sleep as well where in the absence of, of uh, stimuli from, from the senses, 
uh, in particular long-term depression could very effectively happen in order to cancel out certain patterns, thus freeing obstruction that can then be used again for different purposes. That, however, is still speculative and it, I guess it will take many years before we have a result here. One last thing in the, the area of the evolution of the brain, I would like to point out that uh, there is this uh, the recent notion of hybridization um, that uh, significantly changed the way we look at uh, evolution. If you're interested in that, look for hybridization on the net. Essentially, it means that due to different chromosomes, inbred, uh, inbred species for some time in particular uh, keep breeding with among themselves, thus emphasizing certain properties that they have in their DNA, thus generating distinct features. And this might be a booster for the, or is a booster, matter of fact, for the evolutional development of certain species. It was just recently described, um, enhances the picture, creates the, accelerates the speed, with how species are actually created. And this might also have been what happened in the brain or happens in the brain when we see that mammals have certain regions, regions of the brain all together. This might be actually a result of hybridization. But that is just a note. It's really of no relevance for our course. It's only if you're interested in what's going on. I think this is one of the major, major research results of the last decade in terms of biology. Okay, these are the references. As I said, they are also linked in the Two World Forum. All very readable, all very interesting. Um, I recommend that you read these papers if you're interested in what's going on in neurosciences. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, post, it for, uh, post a question in the forum and, um, and watch the other videos as well and communicate um, with your colleagues in order to identify. A solution. Thank you very much.